The time for Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors to treat multiple sclerosis is upon us, as tolibrutinib was shown to reduce progression of disability in a randomized trial. These data were presented at Ectrim September 2024, and I'll show you the results now. The Gemini trials in relapsing MS and the Hercules trial in progressive MS, citations below. For a detailed description of what this drug is, please see a more detailed video, link in the description below. Very briefly, tolibrutinib is a once-a-day pill for MS that blocks the transmembrane enzyme Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which normally activates a complicated intracellular cascade of events shown below that causes proliferation and differentiation of various types of white blood cells, not just the lymphocytes, the B and T cells, the target of drugs like Tysabri, Ocrevus, and Gelenia, but also cells of the innate immune system such as microglia and macrophages, so it could work even in situations where those other drugs were not successful. It has a very short half-life, only two hours. It rapidly dissipates in the blood, but it permanently, irreversibly inactivates this enzyme, so the biological effect is quite prolonged. Also, it avidly gets into the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. A spinal tap study shows it gets within the cerebrospinal fluid within a single dose two hours later. First, I'll show data from the Gemini 1 and 2 studies. These are two identical randomized controlled phase 3 trials in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. So participants were either randomized to get the drug tolibrutinib 60 milligrams once daily. This is the higher dose that was most successful in earlier trials or the drug Abagio, teraflunamide, 14 milligrams. So they were not given placebo or tolaprutinib. They were randomized to another active agent, which does have evidence in multiple sclerosis, although it's regarded to be a lower efficacy drug. And since they're both once a day pills, you wouldn't necessarily know what drug you're getting, although Abagio can in some cases cause hair thinning or loose stools. So it's possible people were not 100% blinded if they had unblinding side effects. You had to be age 18 to 55, mean age around 37, and you had to have either recent relapses or new enhancing lesions on MRI. Most participants did not have significant disability. The median baseline expanded disability status scale score, which is a measure of disability in MS research, was only two. This is a zero to 10 scale, so this is fairly low disability at baseline, and they were treated for 18 to 36 months. So this is something they do in modern trials where instead of having a set study period like one or two years, they're looking for a certain number of events. So some people receive the drugs for less time and some people received it for longer. The primary endpoint of the study was relapses and the two drugs were equal. You can see on the right side the pooled annualized relapse rate or relapses per person per year was 0.12 in both the teraflunamide or Abagio group and the tolibrutinib group, this is a pretty low rate of relapses, only one relapse per eight years on average, but this is disappointing. Tolibrutinib definitely has a greater risk of liver injury, as you'll see, so we would have hoped it would beat Abagio, but in reality, it wasn't any more effective, and most people would regard this study as a failure. And in terms of MRI outcomes, tolibrutinib was a little bit worse than Abagio. Here, we're looking at new or enlarging T2 lesions, as shown in this picture. The purple bars are tolibrutinib, the gray bars are abagio, and there was a weak trend towards more lesions with tolibrutinib. This was not statistically significant. However, for enhancing lesions, active lesions that take up the contrast dye, there was a statistically significant increased number of lesions with tolibrutinib compared to abagio. And at about 0.5 new lesions per scan, that's a lot. I wouldn't really have that much confidence in this medication to really suppress relapsing MS. However, there's a silver lining because in terms of progression of disability, tolibrutinib was superior. This is six month confirmed disability worsening. What that means is someone has a worsening on the EDSS scale, again, the scale used to measure disability in MS in this study. And it's not just random fluctuation or measurement error because six months later, they're still worse. And that suggests that it's a true worsening of disability. And you can see by the end of the study, 9.9% had confirmed six-month disability worsening with tolibrutinib versus 
percent with Abaju, a 29 percent relative risk reduction, only a 3.3 percent absolute reduction. Very modest benefit, but it was statistically significant. P equals 0.023. The same was true for three month confirmed disability worsening. This means you only wait three months to see if the person has recovered or not. And 14.7% had worsened taking tolibrutinib versus 18.5% with Abagio, a 27% relative reduction. Again, a modest absolute effect, but it was again statistically significant. P equals 0.018. And this gives credence to the idea that maybe that slow smoldering inflammation occurring within old lesions or even normal appearing white matter that appears normal on conventional MRI, perhaps driven by innate immune cells like microglia and macrophages. Maybe this drug tolibrutinib works better on those cells than other disease modifying therapies. It is possible, maybe not just hype. Someone asked me on Twitter, is it possible to take tolibrutinib plus another disease modifying therapy? Maybe, although the side effects could be multiple Applicatively worse. And speaking of side effects, the most serious concern with tolibutinib is liver injury. Now remember, the drug it's being compared to, Abagio, also causes liver injury, but tolibutinib causes more serious liver injury. Here we're looking at the outcome of alanine transaminase, a liver enzyme that's elevated in liver injury. And on the left, you're seeing people who had elevation to more than three times the upper limit of normal. In other words, at least three times what is considered normal, and they were about the same. Both drugs cause an equal amount of liver injury. The same is true for three to five times elevation or five to 10 times elevation or even 10 to 20 time elevation. But for very severe liver injury, greater than 20 time elevation of the upper limit or normal, there was five-fold more in tolibrutinib compared to Abagio, although a low percentage, only 0.5%, 1 in 200. The same for elevation of liver enzymes plus elevation of bilirubin, in other words, suggesting there's not just injury to the liver cells, but also overall liver dysfunction in its ability to clean the blood to an elevation of greater than two times the upper limit of normal. This was 0.4% with tolibrutinib versus 0.1% with Abagio, four times more. So there's more serious liver injury with tolibrutinib. However, all of these instances occurred within three months of treatment and all of them resolved. No one developed liver failure. My name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. Before I go further, I should point out that all of this data is not peer reviewed and not published. It was presented at a professional conference, which I did not attend. However, I got it from people who did attend the conference and posted it on Twitter or other sources I consider to be relatively reliable, some of which are in the notes below. Please talk to your own provider for personalized advice, though my personal opinion is that the use of tolibutinib in relapsing MS is dubious given the risk of liver injury and the myriad of other options which are probably more effective. But for progressive MS, it's a different story as we have very limited options. So let's move to the Hercules trial in secondary progressive MS. This is a phase three randomized double blind trial. Again, variable length because it's an outcomes driven trial over two to four years. There were 1,290 participants, and they studied the same dose of tolibrutinib, 60 milligrams once daily, versus placebo, not versus another active drug like Abajo, just against placebo, and it was one-to-one -one randomization, half get the drug, half get placebo. You had to have at least moderate disability, EDSS of three, up to 6.5, walking with a walker, age 18 to 60. So they did include some older people with significant disability, the mean age 48.9, and you had to have no relapses in the last two years. So sort of a non-active secondary progressive MS cohort, and you had to have disability progression in the last year. Now, this was sort of billed as a non-inflammatory cohort, although some, 13%, did have enhancing lesions at baseline MRI. The primary outcome of this trial was not relapses, as relatively few would be expected to have relapses in progressive MS, but actually disability progression, which is the more meaningful outcome in my opinion. This again is six-month confirmed disability progression. In other words, you 
get worse and six months later, you're still worse, so it's not just fluctuation. 26.9% had progression with tolibrutinib versus 37.2% with placebo. So a 31% relative reduction with the drug and a 10.3% absolute reduction. So in other words, you give the drug to 10 people, maybe you prevent one person from having progression of disability. A modest benefit, though it was highly statistically significant, p-value equals 0.0026, so very unlikely to occur due to random chance, and perhaps if this drug were given for long periods of time, the benefit would be more substantial. They also looked at improvement. This is six-month confirmed disability improvement, meaning you improved on your EDSS score, and six months later, you're still better, so it wasn't just a good day, and 10% improved with tolibrutinib versus only 5% with placebo, and it was statistically significant at P equals 0.021. So it is possible to improve with progressive MS, even taking placebo in some cases. But of course, there's the liver, and we did see abnormal elevation of liver enzymes to three times the upper limit of normal or higher in 4.1% with tolibrutinib versus 1.6% with placebo. These abnormalities are more apparent because we're comparing tolibrutinib versus placebo rather than against another drug known to cause liver injury. For more serious elevations to 20 times the upper limit of normal, which is very high and scary for sure, it was 0.5%, 1 in 200 with tolibrutinib. Although they all occurred within 90 days of starting the drug, just like in the Gemini trials, so in terms of vigilant monitoring of liver enzymes, it would be most important within the first three months and then less likely for someone who tolerates the drug up to that point, I presume. All of these elevations improve spontaneously except one, and unfortunately that one person developed fulminant liver failure, needed a liver transplant, and died of post-operative complications, so this is very serious. With this medication, we'd also be concerned about infections because even though it doesn't deplete white blood cells, it does affect their proliferation and function. They didn't release a lot of data on infections. We'll have to wait for the full publication, but they did show risk of some common infections like COVID-19 and urinary tract infections, tolibrutinib on the left, placebo on the right, and they're about the same, so probably not a very significant increase in the rate of infections with this medication. Looking at overall mortality, it was actually the same between placebo and tolibrutinib, 0.3% for both groups, and there were some random deaths that the evaluators thought were unrelated to the drug. Of course, there was one death that was definitely drug-related, which caused liver failure. So overall, I do think this drug is promising in progressive MS. The effect, though modest, is comparable to what's been reported with other drugs that are effective in progressive MS, like B-cell depleters or Mazent. Really, none of these drugs are extremely effective because of the risk of liver injury. I think many people would recommend trying those other drugs first, though for some people they're not tolerated or ineffective. This is a legitimate option, although anyone taking it has to accept a small but real risk of serious liver injury. Despite this, I strongly suspect this drug will be FDA and EMA approved and eventually available. I'd be interested to know, would you take it? I know a lot of people out there are doing great, but some aren't and they know they have slow progression. Would you be the first outside of a clinical trial to take this drug? Why or why not? And let me know if you have other questions in the comments below.